Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 1, please. Turn to that. We're going to look at freedom from fear this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It's a wonderful verse of Scripture. 1 7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of timidity. The King James Bible says, The spirit of fear. Another Bible says, The spirit of cowardice. God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and discipline. Again, I like the King James Bible translation of it better. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Love, power, and a sound mind. And they really, they really are set in contrast to each other. He has not given us the spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of fear, but in contrast to that, he has given us, you know, love, power, and a sound mind. Look at, we're going to be back here in Timothy in about two or three hours, but uh, turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Fear, fear is, fear is, a, is an issue for many people. Fear is, is uh, fear can push you around. It can truly be, as I once heard say, sand in the machinery of life. And it can really be a tremendous hindrance to the life that God has made available for us through the Lord Jesus Christ, that abundant life that's available there. We see right in the beginning, after the fall of Adam and Eve, after they sin, that the very first thing that happened in verse 7, 3, 7, the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God, Yahweh God, called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and was what? Afraid, because I was naked, so I hid myself. Such bizarre behavior considering that before they sinned, they were in the garden naked, ever in the presence of God, never afraid of Him, had a loving, beautiful, harmonious relationship with God, a freedom that was there where there was, they were not hindered at all by sin or the consequences thereof. Immediately after the fall, what they're doing is they're hiding from God because they're afraid of Him. And hence began from that time on, man's relationship with God. So many, many people are afraid of God. And uh, there, uh, there, I, I, I was for many years, especially when I was caught in the darkness that I was after my brother's death, those years of drug addiction and alcoholism and, and, and all of the other addictions that I was involved in. I was deadly afraid of God. I, would, I, 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 I hated to think about God because of the guilt and the condemnation that I experienced because I believe there was a God. And that fear of God keeps people away from God. And it, it's, uh, there's, there's lots of reasons why people have that fear, but in the least common denominator, as I shared a couple of weeks ago, the accuser, the devil, causes people to think wrongly about the God of grace and love and mercy and forgiveness and comfort. A God that so cares about all of us. The last one of all that we should have fear of when we're in trouble is the one that can save us and help us, and that's our God. But the devil puts it up there as the accuser, especially, remember, as I illustrated a couple of weeks ago, after he, he, like he did with Adam and Eve, he tempted them, he enticed them, he's the tempter, he deceived them, he's the deceiver, to sin. And then after they sinned, he came as the accuser and shamed them so that they were afraid of God. 
And that's how he works with us. After we sin, we make a mistake, we blow it, and then the accuser comes and says, see, you are no good. You're a bum. You're lousy. God doesn't care about you. You don't have, you know, blah, 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 blah. and it goes on and on and on. And then we, we feel alienated from God. We feel afraid from God. We coward from God. We, we want to get away from God. All this is caused by fear. And yet, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Go to Romans chapter 8, please. The greatest fear of all, and there are many fears. You know, I, there are, in, in uh, the King James Bible, as well as other Bibles, the word fear is used in a, uh, a positive way where we have profound respect and awe and honor and humility in relationship to God. And, and by all means... You know, considering who our God is as the creator of the heavens and the earth, it's, it, there, there should be a very healthy, godly fear of him. But not the kind of fear that cowers and hides from him like they were doing. Not at all. And I think everybody's born with, aren't we told that we're born with two kinds of fear? Uh, fear of, of getting pimples and fear of overweight. No, that wasn't it. It's a fear of uh, falling and the fear of uh, loud noises, right? Try that with a baby. You know, just get loud in front of a baby, they freak out. So, um, um, but that's not what, really what we're talking about now. We're talking about the kind of fears that aren't so much um, inherited genetically, they're, they're in our lives primarily from the environment or from our, our wrong understanding of things in life. God, hasn't, God doesn't want us to have that. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, it says, For you have, received, you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you received a spirit of adoption as sons which cry out, Abba, Father. This is one of those verses similar to 2 Timothy 1.7 that shows you contrasts. We haven't received the spirit of slavery, again, to fear, leading to fear. But in contrast to that, we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, a term, you know, that, that term of endearment, Father, Father. We haven't received the spirit of slavery, and that's, that's exactly what fear does to people. It enslaves them. Uh, what was that book we read uh, Ten years a slave or seven years? What was it? Twelve years a slave. And uh, this was about slavery in, in the United States years ago. Just horrific the way it's just very, very, very graphic, horrific the way that the slaves were in relationship to the master. And you could see the people just, in, in, in his words, you could see the people cowering because the masters were so mean and so evil and so wicked towards them. And they were just, you know, be, you, we could see them just cowering with fear from the master. That is not the way that God has made it to be for us. We are not given a spirit of slavery, again, to be afraid of God. As we've been given the spirit of sonship. He is our heavenly Father. He loves us. He has a fatherly concern for your well-being. Everything about your life He is concerned with. We should, the attitude, the mind picture is not like this. The mind picture is uh, sitting on your father's lap, as my grandchildren did this morning, sitting on my lap, my arms around them, very secure, and uh, nothing but love going on there, nothing but good feelings and love. That's where we are as our father, Abba, Father. We have nothing to fear. God's arms are around us. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the all-powerful one, is our Father. Abba, Father. There's nothing to be afraid of. You know, uh, you put, a, you put a, a bowl of uh, lima beans in front of me, and you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> no, thanks. You put, you put a, uh, one of those, those big those big disgusting looking portobello mush, mushrooms, I'm not going to say, no thanks. I'm going to say, no. 
Thank you. I'm not taking that. We don't have to take, you know, this, this uh, spirit of slavery because God didn't give it to us. God did not give us the spirit of fear. That's not coming from God. We don't have to say that. No, 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 no. I don't want that. I have been given power, love, and a sound mind. God is my Father. We have to have this, this mindset of determination that we're not going to allow fear to push us around. <laughs> In uh, Mark chapter 5, please. When I, when I traveled around the world, uh, when I was involved in international outreach, I went to many places in the world that were um, dangerous. I was in, I was in uh, East Berlin when, before the wall came down. And uh, when I traveled from West Berlin to East Berlin, myself and two other men, we were going there to witness to someone. We had a referral uh, of a family member, and we were going to seek this person out to witness to them. Getting through the border was just... It, it, was, it was somewhat intimidating, that, and that's an, uh, it's an understatement. I mean, they, you know, there was uh, guns, and they, the guys were nasty, and they, they searched us from head to toe. They made us pay to get in. I mean, it was just, they were really, really uh, rough with us. And then when we got into East Berlin, the streets were just dark, and, and it was just, it was just a, this uh, ta daunting atmosphere. We got to the guy's house, and uh, he was a doctor, and he, he, was, he, was, he said, come in quickly, quickly, and closed the door because he was afraid that the neighbors would report that there were people coming to his home. That's what, uh, that, in the communist situation there, that's, you know, they were, that was the requirement. If you saw something suspicious, you were to report it to the government. If you didn't, then you were in trouble. And then when it came to, we witnessed to them, the guy accepted Christ that night, and the, him and his wife, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience, and uh, hours with him. And then when we were leaving, they drove us and back to the, to the border, but they left us off two blocks ahead because they, they couldn't be seen with us. And uh, going back over the thing, you know, there's all this barbed wire and all this, and it was just, you know, like you see in the movies. And through that all, I, I, I can honestly say, as God is my witness, there wasn't one ounce of fear in me. I didn't, I didn't think what, for one moment that there was a problem, nor did I think that way when I was at the DMZ in, in uh, North Korea uh, around those years, too. You know, and again, that was a very dangerous situation. Uh, nor did I think that way when I was in Calcutta in India, another communist place. And these different places that I, I and, or in the, in the deep throes of Africa. I remember when I first went to Africa I, uh, uh, in my polyester suit. Uh, uh, I got off the plane in uh, Nigeria I, I, I wasn't going to Nigeria, I was going to Ghana, but the plane, you know, there was the flights and I had to get off at, at Nigeria and I didn't know anything or anybody and, and I, I, I got a cab to go to a motel and uh, when I got to the cab, the cab ride was like, you know, it was like a couple of miles, it was, you know, it was, I was going to a motel that was near the airport and uh, I got to the motel, I, I, made the, I, I was really a rookie, I said to the cab driver, it was a good motel, and, you know, he's going to take me to his buddy's motel, so we, we get there, and I swear I wasn't in the cab for five minutes, I get out, now this is 35 years ago, I said, so how much are you, he says $85, $85, what are you kidding me, and so, you know, then I, you know, we, we're going at it here, and um, now I, I'm, I'm, I've got my bags, I'm going into the, the, to the motel, and the guy behind, the, the guy in the motel, apparently is a friend of this other guy, and the, we, I say, how much do you want? And, you know, the price was just, and this is a dump. And you know, I got, I'm surrounded with all these guys, I'm going back and forth and back and forth. And <laughs> uh, but I can honestly say that there wasn't an ounce of fear. And not because I'm something of significance, because the God that lives inside of me is all of significance. I never had a, I knew what I was doing was the will of God. I knew God was with me. I, why in the world would I be in Nigeria? You know, or East Berlin. I'm from New High Park, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> He's from New High Park too. And if, people from New High Park don't go to these places. No. 
We go to the county jail and places like that, you know. <laughs> no fear because I understood that God in Christ is in me. And there is no reason ever to be afraid when you're inside the will of God. Now, if you're not inside the will of God, you sure as hell should be afraid. There's probably a better way of saying that. You sure as heck should be afraid if you don't have God in your life. But if you've got God in your life, where you go, God goes with you. He hasn't given us the spirit of slavery again to fear. He's given us the spirit of sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, in Mark chapter 5. I love this record here. Mark chapter 5, in verse 2. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he was dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. What kind of nut, what kind of, what kind of uh, person here that was mentally uh, deranged was this guy? He had power that he could break the chains, now he's got some spiritual help. He's got demons. This is a very powerful man. The other Gospels tells us he's running around the tombs naked at night. I mean, this is a sight and a half. He's living inside the graveyard. He's running around the tombs when they try to, you know, incarcerate him. I mean, this is not good for the community. You know what I'm saying? So they try to incarcerate him. They put chains on him. He breaks the chains. Now, I want to tell you, everybody must have ran like the Dickens when they saw that. Well, this guy comes to Jesus. Well, Jesus isn't afraid. Not at all. What's this guy look like? How matted is his hair? How filthy is his body? How, st how much is the stench coming off of this guy? For Jesus, there was no fear. You know the story. It was the, the guy had the, uh, had a, the legion of, of uh, demons. What's that, 7,000 demons or whatever it is? He had a lot of demons. And Jesus said to him, Go. And they all went. Remember, they jumped into the swine, then jumped off the herd. Look at verse 15. Then came Jesus, then came to Jesus and observed. So the, the, the people went and report to the people in town what had happened. They observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed in his right mind, and the very man who had the legion. And they became what? Frightened. Those who had, had seen it described to them how it had happened that the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore Jesus to leave their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had... And so on it goes. So you, you have this guy in your community that is absolutely beside himself. He is, he's out of... You can't, you can't incarcerate him. There's nothing you can do about it. You just got to live with it. You hear this guy howling at night while you're trying to sleep. Somebody comes into town, casts the spirits out. When the town comes out and sees the guy, he's in his right mind. He's obviously had a supernatural intervention. You would think the town would have been, woo, woo But no, they weren't. What were they? They were full of fear. They were frightened. So much so that they said to Jesus, you want to leave town? A lot of people are afraid of supernatural things. A lot of people are afraid of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people are, they, they see something that is not in their five senses realm. It's not something they can see, taste, or touch, or they explain it from an intellectual point of view, and it frightens them. Uh, the, just the mention of demons or casting out of demons, people just, it freaks them out. And... and um, so many, so, you know, the, there's so much wrong doctrine taught about the power of God and the manifestations of God, and there's so much wrong behavior done in that, that people are afraid. And a lot of people are afraid that, you know, to do the things, the supernatural things, they're afraid of being wrong. And, you know, anything as long as I'm, I'm afraid to speak in tongues because I don't want to be wrong. I'm afraid to interpret tongues because I don't want to be wrong. I'm afraid to prophesy because I don't want to be wrong. Well, fear will always back you down. 
Fear will always encase you, and it will always control you. It will always prevent you from doing the things of God. You've got to have some boldness. Lord, can I come to you? Yeah, Peter, come on. He got out and started walking on the water. The other guys stayed in the boat. Peter walked on the water. He did fine until he started looking around. Look, <laughs> I, and I know, I know that there's always, there's, always, there's always something pressing against us so we don't believe that we have the power that has been given to us in Christ. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've got God in Christ in us. We've been given uh, the manifestations of Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, faith, miracles, and healing. This has all been given to us. Now an intellectual guy comes along, a real smart intellectual guy with an English accent and says, Well, I think that speaking in tongues is devilish. Anybody can do that. You know, and hiding behind that intellectual book learning and not having the intestinal fortitude to try out the things of God and to obey the Word of God. There is no mistaking about it. Sean taught it last week on the day of Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. When Peter went to the house of Cornelius and he led those people into the new birth, they spoke in tongues. In Acts chapter 19, when the when they 12, when he went to Ephesus, they all spoke in tongues. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than the whole Corinthian church. There's three chapters, three long chapters in the book of Corinthians talking about how to speak in tongues the right way. There's not one chapter in the book of Corinthians that says, don't speak in tongues because you might be wrong. You got to go to college here in Atlanta, Georgia to find that out. Ooh, that was a little pointed, huh, Shelby? <laughs> Well, I'm tired of being pushed. Look, God gave us power to use. Don't be intimidated out of it. You might make a mistake. You might. There's no question about it. You probably will make a mistake. But I tell you what's a greater mistake. Not utilizing the power that God has given to us so that we can live that way that he wants us to live. I might have gone over the top there. I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't... Um, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Exodus 14. Exodus 14. Don't be afraid to operate the things of the Spirit of God. Just God, God has given you that Spirit so that you can walk with power. Exodus 14, verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, now you're familiar with this. That was a great song you guys selected, that last song before I taught. It was really appropriate in light of the teaching. Um, Exodus, where did I tell you to go? 14, verse 10. And Pharaoh drew near to the sons of Israel and looked and behold, and the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became very frightened so that the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now you know where we're at. They've had the ten, yeah, they've had the ten, uh, what do you call them, plagues. And they've seen the power of God over and over and over again. Now they're at the Red Sea. The Red Sea's in front of them. The Egyptian army's behind them. And, they're, and, and you know, they're afraid. They're frightened. In uh, verse 11, and they said to Moses, Is it because there was no graves in Egypt? That we have, you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What a great bunch of folks. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Leave us in our slavery? It wasn't, bad. It wasn't that bad. They were only killing all our boys. They let the girls live. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, do not what? Fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. What happened to them? They were, what was it? Um, Jay, looking out instead of looking up. Instead of keeping their eyes on God. They were looking at the circumstances. 
They started looking at the Egyptians, which just logic alone, if they would keep their eyes on God. God had just done all of these miracles that they had seen, but now fear. You know, he's called the roaring lion. The reason the roaring lion is so effective is because why, why does a lion roar? It's to cause his prey to, to freeze. Once he freezes, then he can pounce on you. You see, the, fear is really, really is a major problem. It's at the opposite end of faith. If you have fear, you, you're immobilized. You can't move forward. You're frozen. You got all that anxiety and all that other stuff where really what you really need to do is put your foot in the river and get walking. That's what God said to them to do. Move forward. Don't stop. Move forward. That's how you conquer fear. You move into it. You don't move away from it. You don't let it intimidate you. There's no reason to be intimidated. God is with you. I will never, never, never leave you. I will never, never, never forsake you. It's God in Christ in you. I am more than a conqueror in every situation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the stuff we tell our mind. Rather than listening to, you know, the intimidation and the roar of the devil. These people, well, they walk through. But they were intimidated by fear. And that's one of the terrible things about fear is so often people turn their fear and they attack God. They blame God for the fear that's living within themselves. Look at First Samuel. Don't look at the circumstances, the situation, and the people. Or if you're gonna if you're gonna look at those things, if you're gonna look at the circumstances and the situation and the people, look at them from and 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 do what do what David did. <laughs> I love what David did. You know, everybody was intimidated by the giant, right? You all familiar with the record? I mean, granted, the giant was a big dude. You know, I mean, there's no he was an he was an awesome opponent. But look, you got an army with you. I mean, somebody's got to hit the guy. I mean, how can you miss, right? But they're all immobilized. They're all trapped. They're all dead in their fear. They can't move. And then then comes little old David. Woohoo! Seventeen <laughs> year old boy. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? <laughs> I'll take him down. I don't see how I can miss that guy. He's so big. That, you know, rather than the circumstances and the situations cowering you, you should look at them and say, Whoa, this is way too big for me. God help me. This is what we call humility. I can't handle this. This is way beyond my ability. That, that's, a good, that's a good thought. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see Dan here. I, I was thinking of you this morning, Dan. And it wasn't, it wasn't particularly negative or anything like that. <laughs> Dan, Dan went with me to Africa, as did uh, the other Dan. We're breaking protocol here. We have a Blake going now, but... Uh, uh, and and uh, when when what's it Dan uh, Fitz Fitzsimmons yeah Dan Fitzsimmons I'm sorry Al about <laughs> geez man. so uh, my my communication to both Dans was look you can't have fear don't have fear no matter what goes on you can't have fear you know so I said to Tom too when he first came to went to Africa you can't be afraid. If you're afraid, you can't go. Because if you got fear, what fear does is it draws in bad things. If you're afraid, then bad things are going to happen. The point is, don't be afraid, and then you have like a Teflon attitude. You have a tef you know, God's protecting you. It's your armor when you have faith. That if you have faith, then you can't get penetrated. It's when you have fear that you have a problem. You don't walk into a situation that you're afraid of. Or, but then again, I don't know any other way of doing it. If you've got God and Christ in you and you believe it, you do walk into the situation knowing that he's there. Because you can't wait for the circumstances and the negative and the people and everything to get better. The giant wasn't going to shrink. You know, David's attitude was, okay, 
I don't have no fear. And he did. He took that guy down with a slingshot. Don't you love that record in the Bible? I mean, that, that just, he took him down with a slingshot. Or the time, the time with Gideon. I mean, isn't that another great record? There's this 135,000 of the enemy coming against Gideon. And I think it was maybe less than 40,000 Israelites. And then uh, God, says, God says to uh, Gideon, there's far too many of the Israelites for you to go up against. What was it, the Philistines? Sean, do you remember? The 135,000, huh? Midianites. Midianites. Yeah, there's just too, far too many of them. Wait a minute. They got 135. We got 35. And you're saying we got too many? That's what God's saying. You say, to, go get the army together. Gather the army together. Here's their general Patton. Everybody needs something from, okay, any of you who have fear, pack up your bags and go home. And 22,000 of them ran out the back door. <laughs> then God says to, to Gideon, eh, you're down to 10,000. Still too many. You guys are going to have confidence in your own ability. And he whittled it down to 300 men. They won against 135,000. You don't let the circumstances and the situation and the people cause you to fear. You cause it to allow you to be humble and acknowledge that you depend on God and God brings the victory in your life. That's how you conquer fear. And that's what happened in that situation. The 300 took down the 135,000. Where are we in the Bible? Did any? Hmm, I probably already told you everything that's written. No, no, I didn't. First Samuel 15. First Samuel 15. I can fear, I can feel, I can feel fear when it's trying to creep in on me. I, it, I, I can feel it in my gut. You know, I get that anxious feeling. And, and, and that's when I know that I have to, you know, okay, venture depending on yourself here. You're looking at the circumstances wrong. You're, you're focusing on you. You've got to get your eyes on the Lord. Get your eyes on God. What does the Word of God say? Keep my eyes on the Word. Keep my eyes on God and not the situations. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <laughs> Ah, just tricking you, just tricking you. 1 Samuel 15, verse 20. This is after uh, Samuel told uh, Saul, I want you to get rid of every one of the people, destroy them all, all of the, what is the Amalekites, and all of the animals and everything else. And that's not what he did. In verse 20, 15, 20, then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of Yahweh, and went out on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, and the choices of all the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to Yahweh your God at Gilgad. I, I, you know, I, I did everything you told me to do, but the people took some. And Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of Yahweh? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than that of the fat of rams. For the rebellion is the sin of div divination or witchcraft and insubordination is the iniquity of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he said he has rejected you from being king. Now, why did he do that? Why did he not listen? Because of, he was afraid of the people. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. And I think he was telling the truth. I think, I, I think it was wrong, obviously. He should have done what he was told to do, what God told him to do through Samuel. But he feared the people. This is what the people wanted, so he feared the people. How many politicians are there that compromise their morals and their commitments and their virtue and all the rest because they're afraid of the people? 
How many ministers are there that don't have the intestinal fortitude to say to their congregation, listen, Almighty God says that if you're a homosexual, if you're a lesbian, if, you're, if, you, if you have given yourself to this, you must repent because if you don't, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. How many ministers don't do that because they're afraid of the people? How many, how many ministers will, will be afraid to say, look, living together before you're married is wrong. That's not what you're supposed to do. But they don't do that because they're afraid of losing the people. How many ministers are there that have worked the scriptures and have found that the doctrine of their denomination is inaccurate, but don't have the intestinal fortitude to speak the truth from the people to the people because they are afraid? As a matter of fact, there are every once in a while, Sean has recently come in contact with a man that had had the fortitude to do just that and speak out that Jesus is the Son of God and not God the Son. He was afraid, and he ended up getting fired. He lost his job. So did I. So did I. When I was intimidated and I was told that I had to do certain things, I had to follow men, and, and if I didn't, I would be fired, I said, good, fire me. And you know what they did? They fired me. <laughs> and, and, and ever since then, I've been on skid row. I've been sucking, I've been eating out of garbage cans, and... No, I, God didn't forsake me. The organization that I belonged to did. My faith wasn't in the people. It was in the God that, that called me in the beginning. And he hasn't forsaken me one moment. My faith is in God. But that's, you know, the way it works is intimidation. Intimidation. You're going to lose this. You're going to lose that. You're going to lose the other thing. The only thing I'm concerned about losing is my relationship with God. And that is maintained as I am an obedient servant to him. I don't go around poking beehives. I'm not looking for trouble until earlier in this teaching, you know. But, uh, <laughs> you know, generally speaking, I don't do that. But I'm not going to compromise the integrity of God's word because it makes you happy. Amen. That's not going to happen. We would probably have a lot more people attending church if I had that attitude. I'm actually, there's some churches in town that you can go do that. They'll say, they'll say what you want them to say. You know, oh, you know, everything, everything's good. Everything's good. You know, but everything isn't good. You know, whatever. <sighs> Second Timothy 1 7 says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I think that the antidote to fear, and that's really an important thing to close with, isn't it? Let's talk about what is, what do I do? What is the antidote to fear? Well, again, you got fear, and then on the other side, what God has given us, power, love, and a sound mind. The power, again, I thought Sean handled that so wonderfully last week. The Holy Spirit empowers you. The Holy Spirit empowers you. And I got to tell you, those, those, those incidents that I told you about, and I, I have... It seems like I have a whole bunch of those in my life. I talked about when I was in other countries, but I could talk to you about the time that I was in Newark and this guy pulled out a gun and was going to shoot me because I was speaking to him. Well, because of what I was saying, you know, I was there because of Christ. And, and I wasn't intimidated in that situation either. I said to him, in the name of Jesus Christ, put that gun down. And that's what he did. Or the time that somebody pulled out a knife on me and wanted to stab me because of what I was saying. And when I said the same thing to him, put that that knife down in the name of Jesus Christ. And he put it down. And you know, where did, where did that boldness come from? Well, you know, it's just me. I'm... <laughs> no way. In... I am so aware of how weak I am. <laughs> I, I am so aware of how powerless I am and how ineffective I am. But I am also aware of how mighty the God is that lives inside of me. You know, It's, it's the, that spirit empowers us. It empowers us to live a godly life. Don't be afraid to use it. Don't be afraid to walk out on it. Don't be afraid of that spirit. That's what it's there for, it was to empower you. And then, so, so focus on God and his power. And then the other thing is to love. And this was a big, big thing I learned early on as a Christian. I, I, you know, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 
through 18. There's a number of other places in 1 John. It's worth looking at. Please turn to it. 1 John 4. Be a good verse to. The other, the opposite, another opposite of fear is love. Perfect love casts out fear. 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. <laughs> Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have come to know and believe that the love which God has for us, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment. I, again, I like the King James. Fear has torment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. And I, you know, looking at these verses is very confrontational to me. That if I'm afraid, you know, when it comes to witnessing to people or communicating with people or speaking, you know, in front of people or praying out loud, I acknowledge that, you know, that. If I, if I really want to love like I'm told to love, then I need to do these things. I need to act this way. I not let fear push me around. If I'm really going to be a lover, I got to do these things. <laughs> i tell you one more crazy story of my past and that uh, uh, this, this, this guy, <laughs> we were witnessing in a mall and, and uh, uh, this one of the guys I was witnessing with, Sid was his name, and he had witnessed to some guy, and the guy had a question, and Sid didn't know how to answer it, so he brought him back to me. And again, we're in a mall. I was sitting in the coffee shop in the mall, and, 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 and Sid said, you know, could you talk to this guy? I don't know how to answer his question. He has problems with his brother. So I go out, and I, and I start talking to the guy, and the guy says, well, why did God, I can't remember the, his brother's name, but why did God, and then he, he repeated his brother's name, why did God do this to my brother? If God is so loving and so caring, well, and you know, I said, I said, well, he, and he's very aggressive, very, very, very angry. And I said, well, what makes you think that God? And, he said, and then he just repeated it again. Why did God do this to my brother? I said, well, there's a reason for this. He said, well, why did God do this to my brother? His brother uh, was born uh, handicapped, and, and um, he was really aggressive and was, you know, going to, you know, be forced. He was being forceful with me, and you know, he threatened me. And I said, I said, what do you, you want to fight me? Is that what you want to do? He said, yeah, that's what I want to do. I'm going to beat the hell out of you. I said, okay, well, let's go outside. You know, we're in the, we're at, we're in the mall there. And this, is, this all took place in the coffee shop, you know, so everybody's listening to this. So we go out, and the coffee shop was right at the exit of the mall. And we leave the mall, you know, and I go out the door first, you know, the two doors, and then he comes out with me. And I turn to him, I said, look, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop it. And then the guy starts crying. I took him in my arms and, and held him and hugged him. And I said, look, God loves you. You know, he's going to take care of you. I'm sorry your, your situation with your brother, but there's some answers. You know, and I talked to him and talked. And, and, uh, and, and I embraced him. That's the love of God. The love of God eliminates fear. So we went back into the coffee shop. <laughs> you know, hand in hand. Honest to God, the people in the shop, It was cold. <laughs> I should write a book. Um, perfect love casts out fear. So, so it's the thought. Now, let me. I don't notice how I only tell you the good stories. <laughs> I don't tell you about the time when I cowered and I was afraid to speak, and you know, to the guy I wanted to witness, but I didn't have the nerve, you know, and all the rest of that. But uh, the way to get out of that is. God wants me to love. He wants me to be like him. And, and don't let fear push you around. You can feel it pushing you. You can feel it choking you. You can feel it pushing you. Love your way through it. God will give you the strength. Power, love, and a sound mind. Hmm. Fear and sound mind are at opposites. Oh, one more verse. Golly. 
Psalm 33. It's a good thing we made uh, a lunch for you today because I'm going really long. Oh, wait a minute. That wasn't today, was it? <laughs> Psalm 34. That's next weekend when we meet at the park. At uh, the park in Cohoes. In Schenectady. Let me, tell you, let me just tell you this, this record here. To set this up, it's from 1 Samuel. <clears throat> and and uh, David is running for his life. Saul is trying to kill him. You know, this is when he gets the bread from the priest and he's hiding and he's running and he's running. And he has the sword of Goliath and he goes into uh, Gath to the, uh, uh, I think the guy's name was Akish. And he goes in there. And they realize, he runs into, he's, he's, again, he's running from the king of Israel. That's his people. He runs into the enemy. He runs into the, into the place where he killed Goliath, the, the Philistines. He runs into there. And they say, he's carrying the sword of Goliath. I mean, you know, this is all this time later, he's carrying his sword around as a, in a trophy. And now they're going to kill him. They're absolutely, they, got, they got David. And they know it's David. They figured, this is David. They're going to kill him. So you know what David does? He, go, he starts acting crazy. He starts drooling and, 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 and you know, scrapping on the wall and acting like a nut. You know, act, acting very similar to, you know, Matt, you know what I'm talking about. And um, not, not that you ever did that, but, you know, some of your friends. And uh, Psalm 34, so why did David do that? It says this, is, this record was written about that time. This is, this is what David said. I sought the Lord, verse 4, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and are radiant, and their faces were never ashamed. This poor man cried to the Lord, and he heard me and saved me of all his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescue them. And again, you see at the top of this, this is when he feigned that madness. Why did he feign the madness? Because he sought the Lord, and the Lord said, do this. And that's how he got out of the situation. Instead of allowing that fear to overwhelm him, when he had fear, the sound mind is you go to God and you ask him to help you. Father, thank you for helping us not to be fearful, and thank you for your kindness and your grace and for giving us such a wonderful spirit of um, love and power and a sound mind and that we don't have to be crippled by this terrible thing of fear. Thank you for your salvation, for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for your kingdom that's coming and for that great day that will be when we are with you in eternity. And Father, as we go into this new week, please, please guide us. Please forgive us for our sins. Please give us everything that is necessary to live for you and keep evil and temptation from us. In the name of Jesus Christ.